Of all the people who ever lived, only one can say, I am Rick Mayo, creator of the Young Ones, a pan-global phenomenon loved by millions. On the day he was born, the gods cried, let there be light entertainment, and there was. He dreamt the impossible dream, and there will never be another. With Rick's death, I think people remembered just how golden he was in his youth. He was a golden youth. He was very beautiful, an extremely handsome man. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> My God. He did more wonderful stuff than most, and when it was wonderful, it was very, very wonderful. <laughs> If there's been a funnier person, I don't know who it is. I, you know, I couldn't name anyone who's made me laugh any more than that man did. As the, the one person in The Young Ones who was both performer and writer, you know, he was the, the central driving force of The Young Ones. You know, he was the greatest of us all in that way. Rick seemed to be able to produce this stuff and be fairly sane and normal, which is great, you know. And everybody, action! <laughs> When you're Rick Mel, why would you worry about being funny? You didn't have to worry about anything. He was Rick. He just had to be Rick, and that was that. Oh, Comedy weapon. Joke machine. Gag apocalypse. I pick my nose, women get pregnant. If he was a mathematician, you'd go genius. If he was Einstein, he'd get a Nobel Prize. That's how brilliant his brain was. Not that many are beautiful and, and that funny. We can't believe he's gone, because he's still here in interviews, films, and photographs never seen before. Some things last forever, like the legend of Rick Mayo. Why isn't Rick Mayo in a three-hour program? Why is he only in a 40-minute program with other actors in it, for God's sake? Surely, it should just be Rick talking about himself on his own forever. Rick, from the first second I met him, I, I knew that I was in the presence of a great and extraordinary comic spirit. I can remember the, absolutely the moment I first laid eyes on him. It was at a Freshers Entertainment. I was the first year. He and Aid were third years at Manchester University, and he just said, Hi, I'm Rick Mayo. And he said it with such <laughs> utter confidence, utter joy in himself. I mean, he had some quite good lines. He said something about the first first rule you have to do if you're a first year is if you're a girl you have to shag Rick Mayle and if you're a guy you have to introduce Rick Mayle to a girl that he can shag or something like that. But it was the wonderful comedic confidence he enjoyed being Rick Mayle enormously and hilariously. <laughs> he certainly wasn't shy in proclaiming that he was the best. You can do that if you are the best, can't you? His kind of shtick was these layers of fake modesty and, and fake arrogance, you know, you, you never could tell which was which, but you knew ultimately that he was a, a big-hearted and warm person and he didn't, you know, as much as he kind of grandstanded this insane sort of boasty personality, it was, he was, had a huge amount of humility. Am I pleased to see you or did I just put a canoe in my pocket? <laughs> down, boy, down! I have always been known as the man with the largest penis on the planet. I've always kept quiet about that. What does a man with a two-foot cock have for breakfast? <laughs> this morning I had a boiled egg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rick's penis. Good times. It wasn't two-foot. He claims it was. It wasn't. Um, but in Rick's world, you know, it is that big. And in Rick's world, you know, anything goes. No, no, he did have the biggest knob in show business. Rick Mayle was born on the 7th of March, 1958, a Pisces, the poet of the Zodiac, destined to fill the world with love, anarchy and wonderful violence. is at its purest, at its most sublime, is when it comes out of nothing. It's not a clever line, it's not some observation, and that's what was really sublime about Rick. That he could make you laugh, just, you know, without, without saying nothing. What? 
What is it? What's going on? It's the first time it felt like these characters are for me to laugh at. I'm not having to struggle to go why he's funny. He just is funny. You know, my grandparents disapproved of, of him, which was perfect. You know, it was like, brilliant, I'm glad you don't like him, because he's not for you. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Mayle's words were his weapons, and he was armed to the teeth. He was young, he was angry, he was the voice of a generation. My name's Vic, OK? And uh, I've got a couple of... Uh... It's a pretty waste of time. <laughs> 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 Right, got a couple of poems here. Uh, I don't know if any of you are into poetry at all. <laughs> Shut up! I've always liked being crap. Um, playing people who are really crap at doing things. Perhaps I should ask Vanessa Vigvave. <laughs> but I don't know Vanessa Vigvave. <laughs> and neither do you, <laughs> theatre. First of all, it was so beautiful. Your eyes hurt. And then, uh, he did that poem about Vanessa Redgrave, and I've never had that experience since, is that you saw a, a, the, the total star. The male family was Rick and his brother and two sisters. His parents were teachers of drama. Rick's dad was a very funny guy and, you know, used to, you know, they, they do bits of amateur drama and everything, but he would, you know, do, you know, you'd suddenly see him walking behind you on the pavement, you know, pretending to, to have a limp or, or, you know, making a silly face or something. And a lot of, you know, a lot of Rick came from that. There would never be anything ordinary about Rick Mayo, and the sign of things to come happened at his school in Droitwich, Worcestershire. The children were there to praise the Lord, but they found the Rick Mayo. My teacher said to me, uh, Richard, I don't want you to sing at all because your voice is horrible. You have got a horrible voice, Richard. I'm quite serious about this. So I want you to move your mouth as if you are singing the hymns, but I don't want you to make any sound at all with that horrible voice of yours. Do you understand? Yes, miss. So up uh, we stood in front of the teachers and I was going... <laughs> and pulling all sorts of faces and I started getting laughs, which is fantastic. I was getting laughs off the audience during the hymns and pulling all sorts of grotesque faces and moving my mouth out of time with the music and uh, occasionally going kind of no, 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 no. Big laughs, and I like that a lot. So I thought, oh, I like this. I like these laughs. The young Rick lived for kicks. It was 1975, time to follow his star to the English North, to Manchester, to change his life forever. There's a load of us got in to Manchester University, uh, who were kind of sleazy naughty boys. And that's where I met Aid, who was a very sleazy naughty boy. And um, uh, I had a couple of my mates from school, Mike Redfern, uh, Mark Jewison, and I met Lloyd Peters, who's an important person. He's from Leeds. We liked the physical. We were very into um, not just Python, but Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers. And he could do this amazing party trick where he bent the top of his ear into his ear hole. <laughs> <laughs> a very strange thing to be able to do, let's be honest. And it was kind of just sort of weirdly funny. There was quite a few talented young ladies doing something really like that. Destiny decided the University of Manchester would be the start of it all. Rick was amongst friends. Let's go. And they called themselves 20th Century Coyote. Blood, sugar, sex, magic. Love and violence. Rick and Aid. We thought we need someone bigger and louder and more dangerous. And I'm saying, what about that blonde guy? And everybody was really scared of Aid. He had this fantastic long blonde hair and he had John Lennon spectacles on. But I do remember going up and saying, um, Hi, Ed. Uh, uh, hi. What do you want? <laughs> and immediately, the relationship was born. Adrian Edmondson, the prince, the one who knew what had to be done. Together, they were everything, intertwined and ascending to the stuff of legend. 
Two stars colliding for a lifetime. It was fate, and there were pubs. I'm afraid we used to pass a hat round afterwards, and then with the meagre money we got from that, we'd, uh, we'd get drunk. Which seemed like fantastic. Go to pub, make a load of people laugh, get drunk. Where's the problem in that? Show off, make some people laugh, get drunk. Ask girls to come and see it. Girls get impressed by the show. Shag girls. Shag girls, get drunk, have good time. That is light entertainment. Manchester was conquered and London was caught. To the lawless underworld of Soho, they came. I'll do you, sunshine. <laughs> 20th century coyote. Now just Rick and Aid, AKA the Dangerous Brothers. I first saw Rick, I didn't know it was Rick, I just knew this wonderful, extraordinary double act that he did with um, Adrian Edmondson. And that's the first time I, I saw it. And I, I marked them down at the time as being, these, these are extra, this is something pretty extraordinary. You know, these guys are special. <laughs> I'd never seen anybody that confident on stage ever. It just seemed like this is where he lived. He was completely in control of that audience, and people like Jack Nicholson were going to see the show. And Rick was just, and Robin Williams was performing, and Rick was just not even considering them as competition. You know, he was just on stage loving it. He'd just stare at the audience, he'd just start talking, and, we'd be, <laughs> and it was just hilariously funny. He just thought, this guy could do anything he likes. Yeah, we got some. Uh... <laughs> Wacky here, isn't it? <laughs> we're all a bit mad. We were up till midnight last night, <laughs> eating biscuits, anything. We're crazy. We don't care. <laughs> the first time I met him, I was going to the comic strip to perform, and went into the dressing room. And Rick was sitting on the, the table with his back to the mirrors, with his legs crossed and his hair all spiky. And, and he said, "Hello, I'm Rick, and I'm a feminist." And it was—he was so funny, both in his work and outside his work. He was hilarious, and there was that kind of glint of mischief and a bit of danger. I, I adored him. I thought he was wonderful. I can't get used to somebody that talented being that sweet, but he always was. At the high school hall last Saturday night, the moon was out, the stars were bright. I saw a girl with golden hair. I asked her to dance, and she said, yeah. We wheeled and rocked, and hopped and bopped, and flipped and flopped, and then we stopped, and then we started again, and danced some more. I bought a Coke, and we shared the floor. Dub, 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 wop. Oh, gosh, I'm so lonely. Oh, gosh, won't you help me? Why did you take her life when she... What was to be my wife? You know, as I watched them perform, I thought that there was something... Um, something I'd never seen before. Right! Oh, gosh, I'm so lonely. Oh, gosh, won't you help me? Why did you take her life when she... What was to be my wife? <laughs> The brightest and the best were drawn to the comic strip club. French and Saunders, Plainer and Richardson, Arnold Brown, Alexei and Rick and Aid. Delirious, exuberant. Next stop, television. I like millions and millions of people looking at me, just looking at me, because it's all in my eyes. It's all in my eyes. The eyes of the television audience lit up at the sight of Kevin Turvey, and Rick Mayle became a star. Do you know how much it costs to go to America? 96 quid, that's how much. Where am I going to get that kind of money? I was mesmerised by Kevin Turvey. Yes, Kevin Turvey from Birmingham. Kevin Turvey, um, peerless. One day there was a knock at the door, and so I answered it like, and uh, it was the milkman, and I paid him, and uh, he went away, and. I closed the door again and came back inside and... I mean, that's got nothing to do with the story, right? But, no, I just wanted to make it clear that I'm the kind of person who pays his debts. It was almost, it was almost like, uh, uh, like sort of comic diary of a serial killer, you know? You thought, oh, this guy's weird. This is really weird. This is not normal. So I went down to the kitchen, right? That's where I normally have my breakfast, you know? It's got all the gear in there, all the forks and stuff. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I've been there, I've seen it. So that's where I went. Like, you know, I went down the stairs. Well, we got these stairs in our house. It attaches the first floor uh, to the bottom floor. 
No, it's too convenient, like, where it saves all that trouble of, like, getting out the window and shinning down the drain pipe, you know, breaking into the kitchen window, going in and doing it all in there. It's a waste of time. So I use the stairs anyway, <laughs> as per usual. Kevin Turvey was so boring and so precise. He, he saw himself as an investigative reporter and he would investigate lampposts or something. And he was in love with a girl called Teresa Kelly who wasn't interested in him. So I went up to the phone and picked it up, right? Dialed the number. I won't actually like tell you what the number was because it's not important. It'll just <laughs> waste time if we start talking about telephone. <laughs> and she answered. I got the number right. And she said, hello? I said, Teresa Kelly? <laughs> this is Kevin Turvey. Would you like to come over and have supper with me? We're, what we're having is potatoes and gravy and sausages with nothing on it at all. <laughs> and then have sex with me afterwards. <laughs> and she said, well, I'd like to, Kevin, but I've just been hit by a bus and I'll be in a coma until Wednesday. <laughs> happening to her, that. <laughs> no, 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 no. There were other strange characters around in the 1980s, and confrontation was everywhere. <laughs> Britannia was ruled by fear, and the kids, punks, skins and rasters were on the street and the cities burned. From the flames stepped the people's poet. I've been waiting two hours for this. It's a revolution! It was a revolution in the head of Rick Mayer. A hippie and a poet in the same house. Inspired, explosive, beautiful. Because although to you lot, I seem to have about as much importance as, um, uh, as, um... Hippie. A hippie. <laughs> it does happen to be me that does all the cleaning round here. Moan, the... moan, moan, balling, just because you do a little bit of housework. <laughs> Into the student house came Aid Edmondson's psychotic Vivian, Chris Ryan as the cool guy Mike, and all kinds of Alexi Sale. At just 24 years old, the sexy genius Rick May gave the people the young ones. Once in every lifetime, comes a love like this. Young Ones was absolutely a revolutionary series. It's one of the greatest TV shows of all time, really, of British, you know, British comedy. And it was also, it was the, it really was the launching pad for all our careers. I definitely thought I'm in the presence of greatness here. This is, this is terrifically good. Part of the reason it's so good, it's innocent. You know, it's, un, it's unstructured. It's, it doesn't, it just ignores any of the rules because they didn't know what the rules were. Young Ones was a hit from the first episode, and Rick was clearly the star from the first episode, and that's rare, that doesn't happen very often. I certainly didn't know whether anything would happen with it, but it did, and it was amazing when it took off, you know, almost immediately it was responded to. I thought The Young Ones was one of the best things I'd ever seen, because it was different to all the other stuff that went on, it had a different sensibility to it. It was a moment where the lunatics had taken over the asylum, and it was great. I was in the audience at a lot of those shows, and uh, <laughs> Rick and I, I think Rick was, Aid was chanting, as Vivian was chanting, Virgin, you're a virgin, virgin! That was big, some slappy, girly fights, slapping at each other. Virgin! I'm not a 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 virgin! i am not a virgin i am it was one of the greatest stunts I've ever seen done in a TV studio, ever. You, honest to God, you just thought, that is, who are these guys? And how are they allowed to do this? It was just brilliant. Nobody had done it like this. People tried to put them down. But the young ones were talking about their generation. This wasn't just comedy. This was comedy for the kids. Well, I'm going to tell Thatcher that we've got a bomb. And that if she doesn't do something to help the kids, by this afternoon, <laughs> we're going to blow up England! Suddenly there was a, a, a strain of comedy that was directed specifically at young people and went completely over the heads of, of the grown-ups who sort of thought it was crude and, and stupid, you know, when it was blisteringly smart and incredibly funny and so relevant. God, I'm bored. Might as well be listening to Genesis. My friends and I were disciples of the young ones. 
you know? As I recall, it was the only thing we thought about. I just remember running into school so I could meet my stupid little gang of mates at the bottom of the stairs and we could quote every line of the young ones. And we were all mass huge Madness fans as well, so when Madness were on, our little heads almost exploded. Do, uh, do any of you lot know Summer Holiday by Cliff Richard? Yeah, yeah. You am it. I'll smash your face in. <laughs> I'll go sit over there. Right. <laughs> the young ones came along and Mum and Dad were going, what the hell's this? And it's going, get away, this is ours, this is for me, this is not for you. <laughs> It was punk for comedy. I mean, even to the point of Ed Evanson tearing down the, uh, the good life, <laughs> literally on the screen, it was kind of like, it was such a statement. No! No! I'm not watching the bloody good one! Bloody, bloody, bloody! I hate it! It's so bloody nice! The Young Ones was, was sort of... I, I sort of, you know, doing with humour what the Sex Pistols were doing with music and all that, you know, saying the 80s are a dreadful time. Yeah, you know, we've got all these problems with Thatcher and all that sort of thing. So it was quite sort of destroy and rebuild. Did you see that? Did you? They did start a revolution, but when you're doing that, you don't think you are. It's just that they, this was healthy. The success of the young ones was a huge thrill for everybody, I think, you know. And Rick in particular came out of it the most, I think, the most successful and loved comic in Britain at that time. Will you lend it to me? If I promise to be a slave all day tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good deal, yeah. <laughs> Tough luck, buster! <laughs> I have my fingers crossed behind my back all along. <laughs> Rick and the Young Ones was just breathtaking. I just thought it was a fantastic comic creation. I'll probably be disfigured for life, Vivian, and you'll have to pay. Yeah, and then we'll be laughing. <laughs> Not you, matey. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, well, just don't break the glass when you tear your face off, that's all. I won't. I won't because... <laughs> it's not true! <laughs> it was a joke I made up, and you fell for it like the fascist you are! You felt like you were in on a joke. You were sort of laughing with him and laughing at him. It was just so... so exciting. Occupying the refectory, so what? <laughs> this is the real stuff! <laughs> I'm a fugitive! A desperado! <laughs> I'm going to form a new union society, right, with me as president. People who don't pay their TV licences against the Nazis! <laughs> this is only the beginning! I just loved the kind of weird, magical realism of the show. I, I used to love the fact that the vermin and the vegetables spoke in the house, and it, it existed in this weird, surrealist bubble. It was, th there was something... it was like Narnia. Fueling Rick's fire with jokes were Lisa Mayer and Ben Elton, comrades writing lurid tales of student life in Manchester. When you were all at university, did you meet people like the people you play? Or on we a were mild... people like yes. the people. You were, well, they right? were. Ben and I both lived in a house at different times uh, that was <laughs> basically exactly the same, if not a bit worse, than the house with, that they live in in the show. Inspired by their life in Manchester, Rick, Ben and Lisa had created a completely new flavour of comedy. And it was a portrait of student life a million miles away from Oxbridge. No dreaming spires, no footlights. It was scumbag college all day long. If you went to Oxbridge, you, you had a particular kind of sense of entitlement, you know, and, and obviously Rick and Aidan and Nigel and the rest of the gang didn't have that, you know. It was central that they hadn't been to Oxford or Cambridge, yeah, they went polluted with that particular kind of way of doing things. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another edition of University Challenge. It felt more like it belonged to us than it was us watching some very, very clever people be very, very funny, which is what Python could often be, you know. You'd see Pythons do sketches about philosophers and stuff and you'd marvel at the brilliance of it, but you didn't feel like, I don't know anything about that. Whereas I knew everything about, you know, bogeys and toxins are gravy and all that stuff. That felt, yeah, that's, that's definitely my wheelhouse. There was something, clearly in Ben, and I suspect in Rick as well, there was something of uh, Manchester looking out at the rest of the world and saying, come on, we're as good as you. Uh, we're going to take you on. The beautiful young ones were on a high and couldn't get much higher. I met little Richard once and we talked about how to give the audience a good time. He said, get the band on the stage and you get the audience high. When they is high, you get on the stage yourself and then you tick them higher, tick them higher till they can't get no higher. And when they can't get no higher, you get off that stage. It was all over for this revolutionary sitcom. 
After 12 episodes of anarchy, the young ones crashed and burned. That's why we finished the young ones after two series. Well, I think this has done really, 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 really well. And we've always tried to keep the jokes original. We can't think of any more originality because their brains are just exhausted. They've had a really good shagging. Okay, kill the students. Drive the bus off the cliff. Finish, walk away. Next one. Resistance was futile. The boy from Droitwich was now king of comedy. And before him lay the corrupt wasteland of showbiz in filthy, rich and tap Two, three, four. Happiness, happiness. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you one and all. The greatest thing that I possess. The smile of a child, a beautiful woman, just simply being British. <laughs> <laughs> Rick was a very, very handsome man. In all his comedy, he made himself ugly. He would give himself this supercilious sneer, and he discovered that very early on, literally looking down his nose and literally sneering and snorting at what the character would consider to be his inferiors. Well, 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 wonders will never cease. Eddie cutlab has been thinking. Put out some bunting, organise a street party, let off some fireworks, telephone the Queen, give everyone a week's holiday. The man with no brains been thinking. Everybody got to have a lavatory in amazement. One series was all we saw of Richie Rich. The young and the restless Rick Mayle had films to make. Comic strip films. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> One of the best comic strips, I think. Well, God, how many have there been? 30 or 40. But a very good one with bad news. You have British heavy metal and British documentary making being ridiculed. Yeah, I feel a bit wrecked, you know. Did you see the whistle test last night? Sort of, yeah, but I, I was really stoned, you know, and I drank a bottle of brandy and... Yeah. Yeah, I was with this chick, and yeah. we were just about to get down to it. <laughs> I went and put my foot through the television set. Ah, oh, no! Yeah, so it sort of blew up a bit, you know, and set fire to the curtains, and, uh, <laughs> well, I missed the second half of the show, so... I bet your mum was really angry. Well, she wasn't there. Was, was she, Dan? Yeah, but, I mean, when, when she gets back, she's well, going to be really no, angry. She won't be getting back. How come? Because she's dead. Hey? She's dead, Dan. Oh, I get it. Alan's called Vim and your mum's dead. Bad News was one of those things that everybody thinks is a copy of Spinal Tap, but was actually, you know, just t people having the same idea simultaneously. Rick was so in love with himself. He was the centre of the world. He was the centre of attention. Um, so if, whatever was happening, whatever Rick was doing, that was the best, you know? And he wasn't afraid to say that. Those big eyes fix you with kind of, come on, then, we're going to have fun, whether you like it or not. Step me up a bit. Yeah? Up a bit more. Just a touch more. Shut up. You can go up a little bit higher, can't it? I know. All right, just another two or three notches. Good. Yes. Oh, well, just a little bit more. OK, OK, up, up a touch. Up just a touch, touch. Lovely. Okay, we'll try it there. <laughs> the only good news for bad news was the invite from the tube, presented by Rick's friend and neighbour Jules Holland. We're a very visual band indeed. Uh, well, you still want to do an interview? Yes, yes, please, yes, yes. Do you want? I think it's probably just me. Well, no, we can have all the band in. Uh, whatever. I remember when they came up and were doing the bad news on the tube, and they said, right, OK, so you do this, and you said, I suddenly having to remember, and it was like, I, I, you know, I, I said, well, you're going to have to guide me through this, cos I haven't really, you know... But they assumed, like them, I could, I could do acting, but that wasn't really my speciality. And what are you saying to the kids? <clears throat> what I'm trying to say... I mean, what I, when I'm writing a song, I look around, right? And I see, I see everything in, in, the, in the world that's happening, and um, I'm just asking for vengeance, that's all. <laughs> 
Mad on mescaline, Rick and the comic strip gang poured ideas onto a vast canvas from Dorset to planet sex. <laughs> on the way, great minds met. In Mr Jolly Lives Next Door, in the same time and the same place, Rick Mayle and Peter Cook. Can I uh, borrow some fairy liquid? What? Again? Shut up, shut up. Of course you can, Ralphie. Ooh, you're right, Ralph, if you cut yourself shaving. I'll bring it back. The films journeyed to the outer limits of Spain for the guns and poses of the Spaghetti Western incident. You start the row. I went first last time. No, you didn't. Did. Didn't. Did. Didn't. Did. Fistful of travellers' checks. It was absolutely brilliant because I just liked dressing up. I wonder if comedy was slightly more proud in those days. You could make a larger, prouder twat of yourself. Yes. The um, comic strip presents the uh, Fistful of Travellers checks, just not my socks off. I mean, totally and utterly changed me as a sort of fan of comedy and as a person. It was just incredibly good fun. It was like a holiday of massive drinking, gambling, getting sunburnt and making a film at the same time. The swagger within Rick Mayle was straining at the leash when along came the biggest of big characters, Lord Flashheart. I really did think old Flash would have turned up. Best man for Rowan Atkinson's Black Adam. I remember when he first entered in front of the audience, there was an audible gasp. It's me! And he burst onto the set, and the audience just went, whoa, who's that? Flash by name, Flash by nature. <laughs> <laughs> We're all into our characters and, uh, and letting the comedy take care of itself. And then, and then this force of nature erupts on the set, you know, and you kind of get carried along in its wake. I mean, including Rowan, you know, you're just kind of hanging on to Rick's shirt tails, really. Thanks, bridesmaid, like the beard. <laughs> Gives me something to hang on to. Nobody knew it was Rick, because he was wearing this extraordinary blonde wig that he'd had commissioned secretly from the makeup ladies, which was adorned with tiny seashells, which was his idea, which nobody could possibly have seen, but he was a kind of mad perfectionist as well. <laughs> I've got a plan, and it's as hot as my pants! <laughs> when I joined Blackadder and started writing Blackadder 2, I was determined that there should, we should... Rick should be in it. I mean, he could not be a regular, he wouldn't have wanted to be, and they certainly probably wouldn't have had him. <laughs> Blackadder is a great character, it's well written. That was what Rick could do, he could inspire you to write good stuff for him. So long, suckers! Next time you get bored of your lives, give me a call, and I'll come round and kill you! Bye, Edmund, and thanks for everything! Hooray! The scene-stealing Flashheart came twice, returning to make life in the First World War trenches even worse for Captain Blackadder. Ha! Eat knuckle, Fritz! Look! First World War, you never kind of think of it as sex, but Flashheart comes on and his gear is so sex. I mean, it's such total 200% sex. Mm, and it just, just made me move and just be. It was great. I got my pistol, I got my lariat, I've got everything I need. It's just, I am a living penis. <laughs> Mind if I use your phone? If word gets out that I'm missing, 500 girls will kill themselves. <laughs> I wouldn't want them on my conscience. Not that they ought to be on my face. <laughs> he pretty much stole everything he was ever in. Flash is not dead! I simply ran out of juice. <laughs> yeah, and before all the girls start saying, oh, what's the point of living anymore, I'm talking about petrol. Woof, woof! <laughs> he made no secret of it. He'd walk in and say, right, I'm going to steal it, you know, and, and then he, he would. And I think nobody ever minded because... Rick's greatness was so unique to him that even if he did steal something, in a way, he didn't, he didn't detract from anybody else because he was like this sort of firework in the middle of it. Rowan was sort of blown out of the water by Rick. You know, it's like he's playing... It, he's, he's not playing by the rules. He's actually come on and just ripped through the whole episode and stolen it lock, stock and barrel. The UK was now ruled by a new breed of politician, and Rick wanted to fight back. He met the writers, Marx and Grand, to plot his revenge on the government. I said, yeah, I want a real bastard, a real bastard who's in the... And we were talking about how much we hated the Conservative government because of the unhappiness that they caused. I mean, real pain, hardship and unemployment, and they destabilised the only kind of defence that they had, the union movement. 
But really, we just want to get some laughs. And I need a target. I need someone I hate to be. And uh, so I said, Buzz, and someone probably, Lawrence or Morris, said, well, we're coming Bustard. Yeah, that's good. Conservative MP Alan Bustard was the super villain Rick was born to play. Hello, Alan Bustard, biggest majority in the House of Commons. <laughs> he beautifully embodied the evilness of that regime. <laughs> Remember the fortune, Scott? See, I do. I made a fortune. <laughs> to carry that kind of arrogance and sneer and snobbery and bigotry without making it too horrible to watch, was, was, it's really, really clever. He just... I think Rick had a power to what he did, which made him always watchable. And when he does Alan Bastard and all that nasty, nasty character, but there was something kind of terribly watchable about it. I'm your new French mistress. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Sex, violence, cash, and more sex. It's very sexy, that show, very sort of... I mean, it was. It's quite a horny show. I told you what would happen if you failed your French oral again. What? Fizzing with energy, that, that performance. Even though he's playing a Tory cabinet minister, I mean... Tory cabinet minister and fizzing with energy don't normally sit together in a sentence, do they? And so to the USA, to wreak havoc with the big movie, with Drop Dead Fred. Some Americans presented me with a script about Drop Dead Fred, who's an imaginary friend, which in 1990 I went over to make in America. He's a good New York writer, and it was a huge success. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be sick all over you immediately. Lie down. After all his adventures, Rick now returned to his other half, Aid Edmondson. They were about to hit the sweet spot. The only way was up, bottom. The young ones was your teens. Then to say filthy was about your uh, 20s. Let's say that bottom was about your 30s, where there's just... Youth is it's just like shit now. Like Life is fucking nothing. When Rick and Aid invented these two absurd, endlessly bickering characters living this half-submerged life in a sort of sleazy world of nothingness, it was Rick and Aid at their best. OK. OK, OK. Let's sort this out. Are we good friends, Eddie? We've known each other for a long time. We can talk. And there is something I have been meaning to say to you for the last 25 years. <laughs> oh. What's that? I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! Go away and crawl away and die in a ditch somewhere, you bastard! Bottom was fantastic. It was two people that shouldn't be together but are, uh, that just constantly at going at each other. <laughs> An unbeatable combination of physicality and violence. They're like a real-life Tom and Jerry, you know. <laughs> Aid and Rick really spent a lot of time working out exactly where the camera should be so that it really looks like you've hit somebody properly with a fright, but it takes a lot to do. They were capable of really, really smart, blistering satire, fantastic sort of politically skewed, uh, you know, contemporary comedy, and yet you could see what they loved doing was punching each other in the face, you know? <laughs> Yes, it was crass, and yes, it was stupid. It was really stupid, but it wasn't half funny. I mean, nothing now remembering it, but the him and Abe were... It was priceless, you know. No-one did uh, crude comedy so poetically, I don't think. It, it had an unreality. That was absolutely what Rick and Aid were about. Yeah! An absurd unreality of two idiots right. who could never really compete in the real world. People sort of fell for him and, um, f and were worried for him, you know, because he was this sort of uh, just complete idiot, but b b trying, to, trying to mean well but getting it wrong. And it was like, oh, you know, they just wanted to cuddle him and sort of, you know, befriend him and take him under their wing. The whole soliloquy is about 
life and not having a bird, living with each other and being miserable. I love that. It's Friday night, and everywhere you look, there's buildings full of people all doing it. <laughs> all doing it and doing it, and then stopping and having a fag and then doing it a bit more. <laughs> there's not a single one of them saying, hang on a minute, this really isn't fair. I mean, here's us doing it and doing it and doing it, and there's poor old Richie and he hasn't done it, ever. <laughs> She hasn't got anyone to do it too. I'll tell you what, I'll pop down and do it to him for a bit, and then pop back up. Would that be all right? Bottom was the Rick and Aid masterpiece. Men leading lives of noisy desperation had never been so spectacularly funny. And Rick's adoring fans loved every minute. I mean, as soon as he comes up, I mean, Richard. Rick, you know, immediate rapport with the audience. Immediate. That's that's who he's that's who he's relating to, really. He was a big show off. You know, he he loved he loved performing. He loved showing off. He didn't really mind people looking at him. You know, he, yes, it's me. Rick's public uh, loved him, adored him, even in a way that few comedians get that kind of love. You respect Cleese um, mightily, or Peter Cook, or but whether people love them as, as if they knew them, I think is, is not quite the same as what Rick had. There's something that came through the persona which made a direct connection with people, which is very unusual. In 1998, in the fields around his home in Devon, Rick Mayle had an accident which changed his life. The comedian Rick Mayle is in hospital with serious head injuries after an accident at his country home in Devon. He fell while riding a four-wheel motorbike and was taken by air ambulance to hospital in Plymouth. Doctors say his condition is stable. I was technically dead for five days. What's fantastic about that is that um, it happened on what my kids call Crap Thursday because it was the day before Good Friday, Easter uh, 98, and I died that Thursday and then uh, I came back on the Monday, which is the day after Easter Day. Lord knows I'm a modest man, but I'd beat Jesus by two days. The accident seemed to have stripped him back down to his essence, really, of this very sweet, slightly vulnerable, um, rather kind, gentle man, really. <laughs> Rick and Aid resumed their partnership with the mayhem of Guesthouse Paradiso. We were wondering if you had any rooms. Yes, we'd like two rooms adjoining. Yes, with a sea view, please. Gosh, you're quite forthright, aren't you? In your demands. My word, Eddie, important people here. Well, first things first. Have you got any valuables that you'd like me to put in the safe? Working with Rick was, you know, I was starstruck, you know, and we'd sit and talk about the young ones, and he'd not long had his accident, and he was kind of, he was a self-confessed scatterbrain, so I, I would know more about the show and remember more about it than he did. But it was so fun to be around him and see how he interacted with the crew, you know, everyone seemed to love him, and he was, he was quite openly insecure about um, stuff, you know, like he'd do a take, and if the crew didn't giggle, he'd want to know why, you know? And it was like, well, because they're being professional, Rick, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're trying not to ruin the take by snorting over the sound. Rick Mayle's return to television in Jonathan Creek was another triumph. Morella Carney had already departed this world by 12 noon yesterday, a good four hours before she shot herself. And if you can come up with a better trick than that, Mr. Creek, I'd like to see it sometime. There would be countless more television series and films. We always got Maximum Rick, and the bottom tours brought the house down every night in every city across the United Kingdom of Rick Mayle. Like good whiskey, Rick Mayle got better with age. The devilment deepening, the behavior unhinged. And as Greg Davis's father in Man Down, a performance as good as it gets. I wanted to show her how much I cared. So every night, 7.30, I'd walk here and wait for her to come to that very bedroom window. And I'd wave at her and blow her a kiss. She'd blow me a kiss. Then I'd walk home again. Every night? Every night. 18 months and 11 days. That is one of the most romantic stories I've ever heard. <laughs> well, anyway, all's well that ends well. Eventually, 
I fucked her against that wall. What? Yeah, that very wall. Certainly since my late 20s, people have been telling me that I look like him. And uh, so when I knew I had a sitcom, he was the fantasy casting to play my dad. All right, thank you, goodbye. Right here. Like this. <laughs> Just is funny to see someone shagging a wall. It, if it's done properly, it just is. Him as a performer, it's, he held nothing back. He threw caution to the wind. He would throw himself... He threw himself over a car in a bear suit. <laughs> it was a really great atmosphere on set. I had a hug every morning from Rick Mayle. Yeah, every morning on set, I was greeted with a hug. Does he need a hug from the bear? Come and have a hug from the bear. No! <laughs> He put his arms around me and he whispered, Comrade, in my ear. And I thought, well, yeah, I won't be forgetting this moment in a hurry. <laughs> Rick Mayall died on the 9th of June, 2014. He was on all, all the front pages, I mean, all of them, uh, across the whole range of, you know, red tops to um, broadsheets, um, which I can't really think of another person in recent years that was same was quite true of. There was one wonderful thing. I think it was the front page of the Times. And Michael Gove had been saying, we must, in schools, inculcate British values. And next to it was a picture of Rick looking absolutely mad. And I'm sure the Times must have done that on purpose. It was a wonderful, wonderful front page. When he died, there was this extraordinary outpouring of affection that he... You know, which was, in a way, you just thought, how many people loved him, really? I think there was that big outpouring when he died because um, he never offended anyone. Every, he liked everybody. I wasn't surprised at all by the, by the national reaction to him dying. No, I wasn't surprised at all. Quite right. I think that's what he would have said, quite right, too. It's really wonderful for his family and his kids, and he would have been, he would have been very pleased, I think. What's great is that his children will be able to look at what was said, and it's all true, about how very special their father was, not just to them, but to the world. Rick, the student from Scumbag College, failed his degree. But 20 years later, Rick Mayle, the man, was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Exeter. Older, wiser, Dr. Rick Mayle knew the secret of life. Let me give you youngsters a present. Five mantras to carry with you through your lives. These are mine. Number one, all men are equal. Therefore, no one can ever be your genuine superior. Number two, your future is as bright as you make it. Number three, change is a constant of life. So you must never, ever lose your wisdom. Number four, if you want to live a full and complete human life, you have to be free. And number five, love is the answer. Love is the answer. Bon voyage! He was unique. People like Rick don't come along very often. Blimey, 56, you know. That's, that's, that's too young, yeah. It does seem impossible that that amount of energy can be extinguished, you know. So you find yourself, you know, wishing you were a Buddhist or something, and think, well, it must go somewhere else then. It must go into somebody else, you know. That moment somebody's been born with Rick's energy and talent, that'd be, that'd be you know, that'd be something. Last time I saw him properly, properly was at a birthday party. He was just very funny and very charming. He wanted to work. He was pitching ideas. You know, he wanted <laughs> he wanted to do an interracial cop buddy movie where everybody thought we were gay. <laughs> he loved the business. He loved that everyone else was doing it. He loved the fact that you know it was a means of making money. It was just like he was in this sort of complete heaven where he could express himself so faultlessly and so naturally and just be very, very successful at it. It was just like every day was a joy when he woke up. It was amazing. His incredible generosity of spirit, love of his friends and endless optimism was with him all his life. And it, I miss him very, very much. 
once in every lifetime comes a love like this. I need you. You need me. Oh, my darling, can't you see? Young ones. Darling, we're the young ones. The young ones shouldn't be afraid to live, love. There's a song to be sung. Because we may not be the young ones very long. Willie to 